Welcome to My Blockchain Island. I'm your hostess, Carla Marie. Hi everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of My Blockchain Island. I have another awesome treat for you guys today because in the studio, I have with me Mark P. Benegar. Almost got it right. Mm, perfect. <laughs> That's perfect. From Crypto Finance Group out in Zouk from uh, the Crypto Valley. Crypto Valley, Crypto Nation Switzerland. Crypto Valley. Call it, and, yeah. and now you're on Blockchain Island. Yeah, first time here in Malta. I'm excited. I mean, there are so many things happening here as well. So I think uh, Switzerland and Malta seem to compete a little bit against each other True. in a, in a friendly way so far. And uh, for me, it's interesting to explore what's happening here. Mm. I think it's a good, that's already a good point that you've just made there. It's like often that often nations are kind of or, 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 s or countries within the Eurozone are considered as like regulatory competitors in a way. But ultimately, a lot of startups that are looking at the landscape now just consider it as like a cohesive whole. Just like, well, I'm going to be multi-jurisdictional. I'm going to be in all the different states. Mm. So it kind of helps us more as nations to come together and, and understand the, the strengths and weaknesses of each other to build a more stronger community attributing to the crypto crypto space. Yeah, That's definitely. And I also think, I mean, the whole space is in the very early, early days. Mm. So we're just uh, at the starting point in uh, most fields and that's why I think it's not about competition, but it's about building a sustainable long-term ecosystem. Yeah. And the more countries uh, moving into this space, enabling new entrepreneurial ventures in this exciting blockchain space, uh, the better for the whole ecosystem. You said that um, we're just in the very start of this space, but you've been actually involved in the blockchain community uh, since 2012, I believe? Yeah, I mean, I, I moved into, I mean, I invested in fintech since 2010 and naturally uh, the whole how future payments would look like uh, was part of my daily life. And uh, in 2012, I read for the first time the, the white paper uh, of, of uh, Satoshi. And Mysterious uh, Satoshi. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, was honestly uh, less from a technological, technological perspective, um, but more from an economical perspective, very fascinated to create a decentralized system to exchange values. Uh, and um, yeah, I just bought my first Bitcoin and that's normally the best way to get into something new. That's it. Back then I gave away quite a few Bitcoin, single Bitcoin to friends of mine. Uh, most of them lost them in between. <laughs> but it was an exciting time. And that's back the, then story of, the story of Bitcoin. It's just like everybody's kind of like, yeah, well, I had one once a very long time ago. Yeah. But don't have it anymore. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, back then it was all about uh, geeks and people interested in the technology and the power behind it. You had hardly any, I mean, literally you had no speculators, no piggybackers. It was really a completely different community. And uh, yeah, now it looks a little bit different, but um, I think we're still in the very early days of the whole development. Yeah, I think the technology has, has a little bit further to come. Um, and I think that the user experience in particular is something that needs to be honed in on. Like if people are still losing coins, I think I hear a lot of stories like this, like I'm losing my coin, I don't know how to create a wallet. I, I don't, like then that tells me that right, technology is there, but also use experience layers and the, the components around it that make it more accessible to mass adoption. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, as a technology pioneer, I founded my first internet company in 1999. I saw quite similar developments already and I think as long as most people talk about technology, in this case about blockchain technology and not about real use cases and the masses, they don't care about the technology behind the uh, uh, solution. So as long as we don't talk about added value services, more efficient services, cheaper services, better services, we're not at the point where we really have a mass adoption. That's so that's it. why that's for me the ultimate tipping point when nobody cares about the blockchain technology yeah. and is just using it in their daily lives. Exactly. Like who really cares about HTML5 as exactly. long as everything it's on the exactly top the same works, the right? exactly protocol. I mean, <laughs> literally nobody understands it, but everybody uses it all the time. It. And uh, it will be similar with the uh, blockchain that's technology. That's it, that's it. Um, but, okay, let's, uh, let's jump back into the whole crypto finance uh, group out, out in, in, in Switzerland. Um, you're quite a unique company in that sense because you're one of the, f the f well, you're the only licensed entity by, is it FEMA, the regulator? FEMA, yeah, FINMA? the Swiss regulator, yeah. yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about, about the company and, and what you guys are doing? 
Yeah, I'm one of the board members of um, Crypto Finance Group and our main mission is to bring traditional established investors into this new uh, crypto asset class world. So we build a little bit the bridge in between these mm -hmm. two worlds. Um, 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 my colleagues are very uh, traditional, very established, very uh, re-owned um, people from the traditional banking world. Uh, our CEO worked at UBS before for the head asset management. So we really have a very boring traditional <laughs> setup. But um, that's not fair. You're in, they're in crypto. You can't call it boring. Exactly. Anyway. <laughs> but the underlying uh, work we do is perhaps a bit more fancy. But it's good to have foundations in in, in, in in traditional. I think it's great to have foundations in traditions because then it just allows you to explore new innovations with more confidence as well. So yeah, and especially if you look at our target group, big family offices, ultra high net worth asset managers, hedge funds, other banks. Mm -hmm. I mean, for them, it's already quite fancy what we're doing. So if they would see crazy people behind it, would be perhaps a bit too crazy for them. Yeah. So they like it that they come to the it's office and it looks very traditional. Yeah, yeah, it's comfortable. It's like your typical like asset management kind of, you know, feeling about about it. I guess when you exactly. have the experience behind. If you it. come to our office, it's called the Crypto Villa in Zurich. It really looks like a traditional Crypto private Villa. Bank. Yeah, that that's doesn't what sound too them. traditional. That's a little bit more fancy than perhaps other things, but uh, it's a very nice uh, yeah, villa in the middle of the financial district in Zurich. And uh, funnily, we have sometimes really people just from the outside taking pictures, uh, hashtagging it with a crypto villa in Zurich. <laughs> so it seems to become a little bit famous. So from the outside, oh. it's perhaps fancier than from the inside. I want a crypto villa in Malta now. Yeah, I mean, as soon as you're in Switzerland, you're always wait, uh, invited to our one. I don't know if there are crypto villas here. I there's guess go so, there's going to be. Yeah. I'm going to make a crypto villa somehow. I'm going to, to establish a crypto villa. <laughs> yeah, you never know. My listeners are going to help me. A lot of crypto me. castles, right? Crypto so, uh, castles. So we, we don't have, have castles, but villa. we have lots of nice Mediterranean villas in Malta, which uh, I'm sure you're going to... Because uh, I have to tell the listeners that Mark was just like jumped off the plane and straight into the studio. From yeah, right, <laughs> on right on time. Right on, <laughs> right on yeah. time. Very, very, very much Swiss-like. Right on time. Thank yeah, you so much. two minutes before the <laughs> session started, right? <laughs> so that's gr so great. So you, you just are talking about the type of clients you're working with. Do you want to... Like like elaborate on the service, the services you offer them yeah. and how you introduce them to the crypto space then? Yeah, we have uh, literally three layers, um, three companies which serve three different needs in the, in the whole uh, market. One is a, a crypto storage uh, solution focusing mainly on institutional grade um, um, clients. So we help uh, big traditional uh, investors to store their crypto assets. We have a crypto brokerage uh, division where we do uh, brokerage services, also mainly focusing on qualified and bigger investors. And then we have an asset management division where we have several products, funds, which are um, also focusing on uh, bigger investors. And the interesting thing, for example, at the asset management division is that we just recently got as the first uh, company uh, in Switzerland the approval from FINMA um, that we are now the first fully regulated asset manager in the crypto space. Mm -hmm which is uh, quite a big story. I mean, yeah, we worked massive. roughly 11 months on it. Yeah. So uh, we really try a little bit to not just uh, fight against the uh, existing status quo, but somehow uh, following the existing rules and really open a little bit the gates mm -hmm. for these new entrants in these fields. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, yeah, if you know the regulatory framework in Switzerland, it's crypto friendly in general, but ultimately you still have to apply to the same rules than the traditional mm -hmm financial services providers. Gotcha. So that's why um, yeah, we're quite proud and I think there are quite a few other things coming in the next few months. Good. So uh, exciting times ahead. We're roughly 50 people. So uh, as I said, always invited to uh, have a look. That's great, that's great. What excites you the most about, about crypto assets? I mean, it's a very specific kind of it's a very hot, hot topic. I mean, it's just like everybody's talking about crypto. It's like Crypto assets. What what excites you about this space? Because a lot of my a lot of the listeners are maybe not investors, high net worth individuals. Maybe they are. If they are, that's that's wonderful. But um, if we were to break it down, like what is it that makes makes it for you that's so you know predominant about this asset class? Yeah, I mean, when you go back to the foundation, let's take just the blockchain technology. I mean that you have a decentralized solution, um, which is. Uh, not controllable, uh, not influenced by governments or other individual parties without any middleman. 
I mean, that's ultimately for me the key driver of this whole new crypto asset class. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin is the most famous example, but you have other ones also perhaps in other use cases. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the uniqueness, right? You don't have the traditional established system we know as the backing of this uh, new uh, asset class. It's really a blockchain technology based uh, uh, system. And I think in a few years from now, we will look back and say it was quite outdated how our existing system worked, but mm. that will need some more time. Yeah, I see, like you've stressed on time a few times there, and uh, I'm, I'm also of the, the let's give it some more time group, I think, and a lot of people I speak to also keep on, keep on pushing on the time elements. So, um, what assets are, are we dealing with here? Is it, the, is it Bitcoin, Ethereum, like which, which channels are we? I mean, at Crypto Finance Group, um, we are focusing on the on the on the bigger the uh, core, core mm -hmm. uh, uh, coins um, with crypto storage. I think at the moment we are able to roughly store 60 coins, but ultimately, when it goes to uh, demand from bigger clients, trading, asset management, mm -hmm. it's focusing. I mean, you see it at the market cap of these coins. I'm personally very uh, into the whole privacy coin space, but uh -huh. that's something uh, we are not able to touch as a regulated company. Uh -huh. Can so you I tell? Think can that's like a different part yeah. of the whole. Uh, okay, cool. Can you tell me a little bit about privacy coins? Because I don't know a lot about about that space. I mean, that's just something I I'm very interested in personally. Personally, yeah. because I think a lot of the things we see now now try to let's say, uh, regulate Bitcoin and all yeah. the new technologies in the same way we regulated the existing financial services sure. market. And I think in certain fields it just went too far. Okay. And privacy coins, uh, let's take away the, the, the bad usage of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something nobody wants to support. But to give uh, uh, some more privacy back to the end consumer, and somehow take out governments and political systems out of something which at least, uh, let's say, till the last few years was not as regulated as we have it today. Mm -hmm. I think there's definitely a need for that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's also not efficient how far we overregulated the whole um, financial services market. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, as soon as you have a technology which, which is not I mean, ultimately, privacy coins are very difficult to regulate. You can ultimately just forbid it. And I think that's never solving an mm -hmm. issue. So it will be very interesting to see how governments try to regulate uh, privacy coins. Mm. You've mentioned two very, very, very good points. Um, Overregulation. Um, and uh, I, I will just stop and just have a little bit of a dialogue about that. Um, because overregulation, in my opinion, stifles innovation. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have something with that is like blockchain. It's just like, well, we don't need to regulate it, really. I mean, it exists in the cloud or up here, if you want to, <laughs> yeah. if you don't want to refer to the cloud directly. But really and truly, it's like you, you do have these these perspectives coming out from entrepreneurs and, and just like, you know what, I don't don't need to be regulated because they're, the regulators are trying to push me down this funnel, which doesn't apply to even the way I define my own company or uh, like my company's a DAO. How, how do I even yeah. like, you know, it doesn't even fit into the traditional mo model. So I think that overregulation is a really strong point that you mentioned there because it, it is, it, it, we need regulation for certain parts, but then the innovation part of it can also get very stifled by governments closing in too much. And there, there are a couple of examples that are being mentioned in the in the global news around like how some countries I won't mention country names are trying to regulate um, certain parts of blockchain, and it just it just it just screams that everybody is just going to kind of revolt and just like no. I, I don't yeah. want to be regulated, and they will they will run away. People will just look for the other jurisdiction that will have them, and if the jurisdictions don't have them, then they'll just try to do it anyway. Yeah, and I mean, let's just take, I guess, for, for your viewers, a very straightforward example. If you take Uber, it has nothing to do with blockchain yet. Oh, it's a good uh, example. I yeah. mean, you can either take the existing rules and try to somehow put Uber into it, and then you have effects in certain countries and you just have to say it's forbidden. Yeah. So you protect the existing mo mainly mm -hmm. um, oligopolis um, uh, or monopolies sometimes mm -hmm. of the traditional care market, mm -hmm. or you just say, hey, 
we have a new technology. Mm -hmm. It solves a real problem. Um, it mm -hmm. makes the market more efficient. Mm -hmm. So why just not look into the existing laws and try to perhaps liberalize the existing cab laws mm -hmm. so to adapt to new technologies. And Absolutely. for me, technology is always agnostic. I yep. mean, technology is not left, right, conservative, progressive. Technology is just existing and normally also succeeding on the long run. So it's very difficult for politicians to somehow regulate the technology-based development because literally, as I said, with privacy coins, you can ultimately perhaps just forbid it mm -hmm. and you can't forbid technology. I mean, it's very difficult. Yeah, yeah. It would be a shame if things got to that level. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, <laughs> as long as we have a liberal uh, <laughs> system, at least in most countries, um, I don't see this threat, but mm -hmm. I understand that you have a lot of existing players, big players, they want to preserve the status quo, mm -hmm. which is natural. I mean, why should I mm -hmm. decentralize the business, which mm -hmm. is very, very uh, interesting for the middleman in mm -hmm. between. Mm -hmm. But as I said, on the long run, you can't uh, stop these developments. So you rather adapt, and we saw a few very prominent examples in the digital revolution. Either you adapt or you disappear, That's or it. you shrink to, so to a certain size, which is irrelevant. Yeah. And I think it will be similar in, in these industries where blockchain can really change uh, the whole value chains mm -hmm. behind. Mm -hmm. It just makes me so happy having this conversation because it just feels like, in a way, we always say that we learn from history and, and I think that blockchain is very much tap tapping into the digital revolution and you can l look at a lot of comparisons that happened back in, the, you know, back in the earlier days of the internet and now what we see today happening in front of us. Um, so I know it's your first time in Malta, the blockchain island, or my blockchain yeah. island as I very egoistically <coughs> call it. Um, uh, however, I'm very curious. I've not been to, um, I've not been to Crypto Valley. Um, can you tell me what the general, can you give me a sense of the general feeling about the ecosystem, how it is to be in a, in a, an, an eco a crypto ecosystem like, like the Crypto Valley? Yeah, I mean, what's interesting um, that, I mean, the core uh, developers or some of the core developers of the early days of, of, of Bitcoin and I mean, as you know, um, Ethereum Foundation is based in, in Zug in the mm -hmm. Crypto Valley. So some of the core people and core projects of this whole blockchain revolution uh, are based and were um, originated out of the Crypto Valley. Mm -hmm. And I think that's still one of the reasons why we have a very strong and very relevant ecosystem there. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about uh, financial services providers and we have a lot of traditional banks which now move into mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies. It goes far further. Mm -hmm. So that's one point. On the other side, I think Switzerland is by nature a decentralized state. We have a very democratic, very federalistic system. Mm -hmm. So people uh, somehow, if if you uh, uh, ask them, they don't know what blockchain is, but they understand the, the system. Yeah. And additionally, we also have similar to here, very strong support from all relevant parties. I mean, for example, uh, at the crypto finance conference last January, yeah, our federal I to ask you about this councillor well. mm -hmm. um, announced uh, or proclaimed the crypto nation Switzerland, and yeah. since then that's a little bit like the next step. So it's not just crypto, crypto valley, nation Switzerland. Uh, crypto nation Switzerland, uh -huh. or now perhaps blockchain nation Switzerland uh -huh. to make it broader. <laughs> so we really have a very very strong support from all kind of uh, parties, mm. and uh, I mean coming back to this preserving of the status quo. Mm. I mean, as a small country, uh, similar to Malta, similar to Malta. Um, you, you can't rely on, on uh, big corporates and just the traditional status quo. You have to somehow bring uh, brain power into it and uh, just be in the forefront of uh, technology and adoption of new uh, ways how to do business. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big advantage of smaller countries. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's perhaps also one of the reasons, I mean, when you look uh, at the US, uh, they are far behind. I was always surprised, or I'm always surprised when I'm in the US, how mm. far behind uh, the US is when it comes to uh, mm. crypto related businesses, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's a huge opportunity. I think we missed most of the uh, digital uh, revolution. So most of the big unicorns are uh, in the US. Yes. And I hope that we will see a different landscape in the blockchain field in a few years yeah. from now. Well, uh, I'm I'm always like completely overwhelmed um, by how many U.S. Um, startups in the crypto space, blockchain space, 
are actually coming to Malta. Mm. It's just like like a tiny little island in the middle of the Mediterranean, and they're looking they're looking to to us, to us as a nation, um, to to guide them on how their their organisation is going to be able to you know move forward within some type of regulatory framework, or at least know that there's a community around them that supports them in what what they're embarking on doing. Um, but I really like the point that you make about the smaller countries. I do think that the the, the smaller countries, even within the European landscape, you'll kind of see like Switzerland, you've got Gibraltar, you've got Malta, um, coming out much further and much quicker in their in their in their their opinions and their their frameworks towards um, uh, towards the regulatory frameworks around crypto and blockchain space. So that's very interesting as well. You also mentioned the Crypto Finance Conference, and unfortunately I've not been able to attend, but you had a, an amazing one I heard earlier this year um, in Half Moon Bay, was it? Yeah, in, we did in one in US. California, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you've done others in, in, in Zoot before as well. Can you tell and us? In St. Moritz, yeah. yeah? Have, can you tell us a little bit about the conference and like what, what you guys... Yeah, I mean, the main idea is that uh, there are uh, eight uh, people uh, all uh, active in this field or uh, entrepreneurs and investors and we said why don't we have a conference which is fully focusing on big investors which mm -hmm. are interested in this field so this group of people uh, together um, with our underlying management which is really in the daily business mm -hmm. and they uh, know all the relevant people in this space we just created a little bit out of uh, nothing uh, a conference right before the World Economic Forum uh -huh. in St. Moritz, which is very close to Davos, so a lot of our participants and speakers could combine it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, a little bit out of nothing, we, we generated, I would say, one of the leading events in a very small and exclusive uh, setup. And now we're evolving that, as I just mentioned, we did an event in the US, we will do something in Japan next year. Oh, awesome. The next uh, event will be in January in St. Moritz again, uh -huh, again okay. before the World Economic Forum. And our idea is not that we want to do uh, an exclusive gathering which is close to the public and just mm -hmm. bringing big highballers uh, uh, at the table mm -hmm. and then they do some investments. For us it's really more about also educating these really big guys which mm -hmm. has, have a lot of I wealth. Know, uh, Mm -hmm. They represent a lot of money and also power mm -hmm. to really also educate them, to show them it's not just about speculation. I mean, most mm -hmm. of these guys, yeah. they're wealthy enough, they're looking for more than just return. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of impact investing, they yeah. do a lot of blockchain for good. So yeah. it's far more than just... And uh, there are some really amazing startups doing impact. Like I, I've just been blown away by a couple of cases that I've seen fly across you know, my desk in the last mm -hmm. couple of months, like real interesting when you add the impact investing and the blockchain yeah it just like it's beautiful it's yeah, really really I mean, nice there's so many things happening i was just at the un headquarters in geneva mm -hmm. um, where there was a really big event with binance and some yeah other yeah a couple of the a couple of maltese people i know were there actually yeah yeah, yeah exactly the founder um, of the delta summit exactly yeah. he was also there yeah. and uh, i mean if you look into it ultimately uh, especially for developing countries and some of these global challenges we have and uh, the UN is trying mm -hmm. to, to uh, overcome, blockchain can really uh, be a huge uh, added value, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why I think we see so many things coming together. Mm -hmm. That's why I always say I'm mainly focusing business-wise on crypto assets, yeah. cryptocurrencies, that's yeah. my that's your main thing. focus, <laughs> but ultimately the story behind and also the power behind goes far further, right? Yeah, it does, it does. You, you cannot, I don't think you can be involved in in blockchain or, or sorry in crypto without really you know feeling something towards the back the, the history the story i mean that helps uh, if you're a little bit uh, in the game uh, for, for longer time i mean and i personally also i mean i don't like that we see uh, that the bitcoin price is, is dropping but it no, helps that's a bit of a shame but it's, it's also short-term uh, speculators yep. right? yeah i think so as well and I think I think like you also mentioned like your your crypto the crypto finance conference is targeting a specific niche in terms of that it's not because you're trying to kick people out but it's also every conference has its specific audience exactly. right so you know if if people want to be educated about generic stuff within the blockchain space there's a specific conference and audience that, you know that does that and then you know like executives and decision makers actually within the blockchain space well yeah there's going to be conferences for those people because they're the ones who need to learn from each other and be part of a share economy right 
So I think I, I, I don't see a problem with being a little bit kind of like, you know, segmented. I think we do yeah, need to bring that forward. Actually. I mean, it's really we had uh, last time 170 participants. So it's really very, very it's small, yeah, right? So nice. that's why we were also able to really manually select. Mm -hmm. We had more than 650 applications and out of them we were manually selected the 170 most relevant uh, ones from an investment perspective. So it's a completely different format, but a very unique one. And it helps to, as I said, perhaps attract certain people which normally wouldn't go to mm -hmm. events like that. Yeah. But if you have a very curated, mm. very small gathering mm -hmm. in the Swiss Alps uh, after Christmas time before World Economic Forum with an airport quite close to it. So that makes it very convenient yeah, for a good, certain time. Because private jets and so on can come in there exactly, as well, yeah. right? Yeah. No, that's 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 great. So really and truly, like I if um, hopefully there are some high net worth individuals and family officers watching my show. Actually, I know there I know there's two for sure. Um, but um, these are the type of people that should get in touch with you. And how should they get in touch with you? I mean, they can reach out uh, cryptofinance.ch, and then uh, they will find quite a few. Uh, I think uh, interesting services for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we're always open uh, to talk. As I said, fully regulated, boring stuff, but <laughs> I think that's what most uh, traditional bigger investors are looking uh, for. And besides that, as I said, I'm always also looking for new cases, blockchain based uh, stuff, which is perhaps doing more than just uh, bringing investors and projects sure. together. So I think we are, yeah, we're seeing a lot of very exciting things in the next few months and years. Good, good. Well, I hope to have a catch up from the crypto villa yeah always is uh, welcome. <laughs> yeah just reach out to me thank you so much for coming onto the show immediately from the airport by the way um is there any closing words that you might like to share or thoughts about or, or maybe something that i could think about in the whole space of crypto yeah I, I would just say as a general learning as an entrepreneur um you normally just um uh, underestimate uh, the long-term effect of new technologies and overestimate the short term um, aspect and I mean that's exactly what's happening right now in the blockchain space and we saw it in the tech space already I mean uh, I think the long-term impact of the blockchain technology goes far further than we can imagine at the moment and I mean I think that's perhaps something you should focus on not just about if the Bitcoin goes up and down that's for Very speculators good. That's but a really good point. what's really the long-term impact right really good really 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 good point thank you for sharing that Thank you for being here once again. Yeah, welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, please, if you like what you hear, uh, please share this. It's very interesting content, and I'm sure that lots of people could great, great, um, gain great value out of listening to this. So please, if you like what you hear, please share. Subscribe. I'm going to put some show notes in the description below, and I'll see you all very soon.